Good morning, everyone. Resurrection Sunday today. Welcome. I'm so glad you are with us on YouTube or the Church Online platform. Thank you for joining us today. Resurrection Sunday. I hope that power is radiating inside of you. I hope you, hope you took this week to reflect on the things that Jesus has done for us. But today, we're going to dive into John chapter 20, take a brief hiatus from our series in Colossians. But I want to talk to you today on the topic of that you might believe. Because every single one of us can believe to a greater depth, greater height, greater width, right? Believe what Jesus has says. Because we always, all of us struggle with doubt at different junctures of our life with Christ. So let's jump in. That you might believe today. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 20 of the book of John. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, who we know to be John, right? The one whom Jesus loved. She said in great passion, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running. <sighs> But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stood and he looked in. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there as well, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart, separate from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. That's the key for today. He saw and he believed. It was easier for John because he could see it with his own eyes. Verse 9, for until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. <laughs> I mean, that's it? After seeing that the tomb is empty, they just go home. Yeah. Verse 11. Mary, however, was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw the two white-robed men. Most translations say men. But in this case, mine says two white-robed angels. One sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her, because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus. She didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, who are you looking for? <laughs> don't you love that? Who are you looking for? He knows. He knows she's looking for him. Who are you looking for? That's what he's saying to you. Who are you looking for? That's what he's asking you today. Who are you looking for? Are you looking for salvation in someone else? Are you looking for peace in something else? You won't find it. That's why he asked you. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she says, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Mary, she said, he said to her. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which in Hebrew is for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go, find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. I've seen him. Then she gave them his message. This chapter that we're reading today records three post-resurrection appearances of Christ. And we want to look at the effect that the resurrection had on them. Because, hey, the resurrection can have a huge impact on you if you believe. See, each appearance brought about a different result in the lives of those in, of those involved. So the first one is this, Mary. 
she saw the Lord. What you need to know about Mary is that Christ had cast out seven, seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. And you can imagine the depth of her love for Jesus because of what the work he had done in her life. Seven demons cast out of her. She dearly loved him with everything inside of her. And in her confusion and disappointment, Mary jumped to conclusions and thought someone had stolen Christ's body. She ran to tell Peter and John, who then ran and visited the tomb. The funny thing is, is that none of them needed to run anywhere. If they would have remembered what Jesus said, if they would remember what the scriptures said. Why did John outrun Peter in verse 4? You ever wondered that? Why did John outrun Peter? I mean, was John in better physical condition? I mean, was John younger than Peter? Did Peter have a paunch? I mean, I don't know. Did he have a catch in his get along? I mean, who, how do we know? Why did John get there first? Maybe John was in better shape. We don't know, but there's a spiritual lesson to be learned here. You remember the story. It wasn't only a few days ago that Peter said to the Lord, I will never deny you. Peter declared, but what happened? Jesus said, you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. Peter had not yet reaffirmed his devotion to Jesus and is still grieving and dealing with his betrayal, with his denial of Jesus. So his spiritual energy is low. And Isaiah 40, 31, what does it say to us? It says that those who wait on the Lord shall run and not be weary. See, but Peter had rushed ahead of the Lord and disobeyed him. Peter's sin affected his feet. Peter's sin affected his lip. He denied the Lord. And it's the same with us, that when we sin, when we disobey the Lord, it affects us in many different ways. Not just physically, our sin can affect us physically. And in this case, this is probably the reason why John got there first. He had, he had some greater energy, some greater gusto than Peter. He, Peter was dealing with some heavy stuff. And maybe that's you today. You're dealing with some heavy stuff, but God's resurrection power is here to touch you if you'll believe. What did the men see in the tomb? They saw the burial wrappings lying in the shape of the body, but the body was gone. The grave clothes lay, lay like an empty cocoon. The napkin for the face was carefully folded, lying by itself. It was not the scene of a grave robbery. No robbers could have gotten the body out of the grave clothes without tearing the cloth and, and destroying everything in the process, right? Jesus, no, he had returned to life in power and great glory and it passed through the grave clothes just passed right through them and passed through the tomb itself i mean the power of god rolling that massive stone away verse 8 tells us that the men believed in his resurrection because of the evidence that they saw later they met christ personally and also came to believe the testimony of scripture there are three types of proof that you can rest upon when it comes to spiritual matters. First is the evidence God gives in his world. The creation is God on display, his power, his, his grandeur, his beauty, his amazing creativity. The, the heavens declare the glory of God. The stars, right? The galaxies declare the glory of God. Secondly is the word of God. And third is your own personal experience. How can someone know that Christ is real. He can see the evidence, firstly, in the lives of other people. He can see that someone was blind, but now they see. I mean, perhaps physical blindness, but now they can see. Maybe they were addicted to something, and now they're delivered from it. Maybe they were a complete jerk and selfish loser, and now they're a giving, loving, transformed individual. They can see the evidence in the lives of others. They can read God's word for themselves. And if they so choose to put their trust in Christ, you will experience it personally. See, notice something. Notice in verse 10 that Peter and John 
They see the evidence of the risen Lord. They go back home without proclaiming the message of the risen Christ. They don't tell a soul. What, do we, what can we learn from this? Mere intellectual evidence alone will not change people. We can give you all the evidence that we could ever come up with intellectually, and it will not change you. You must meet Christ personally. You must. You must meet him personally. This is what happened to Mary. She lingered. She lingered. And she met Jesus. How many times, how many times in our life has it paid to wait? Oh, I know it's frustrating waiting in lines. Oh my gosh, it's so frustrating. DMV, are you kidding me? It's frustrating when I want ice cream and I have to wait. It's frustrating when I'm hungry and I have to wait in the drive-thru. It's frustrating. Although I probably shouldn't be eating in the drive-thru anyway because it's not healthy. You get my point. But how many times does it pay to wait? See, there's been many things in my life recently that's caused me to have to wait. You know, things that are completely out of my control, I can't control it anymore. And instead of just laying it at the feet of Jesus, what did I do? I started to get a little anxious. I started to try to, try to figure it out in my own intellect. It doesn't work. But you know what transforms you? When you just put your trust in Christ. When you just say, you know what? I can't carry it. And God's like, yeah, you can't. Put it at my feet. Give it to me. I'll carry it for you. And you know when I did that? Just putting it at his feet, man. Pop, 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 pop. Just stuff happened. What I thought was late was, <laughs> was right on time. I expected something to happen over here, but it happened over there. And over there turned out to be better than it was over here. Perfect timing. God is never early, but he's never late. It may be midnight. It may be midday, right? The new song by Toby Mack. You got to check it out. It's great. But he's never early, but he's never late. And look what Proverbs 8 verse 17 says. I love those who love me. I love it. The Lord says, I love those who seek me diligently. And those who do, you'll find me. You seek me diligently, you'll find me. See, Mary waited, and she saw two angels in the tomb. Luke 24, verse 4 calls them two men. But was she was consumed with her grief and would not let those angels comfort her. The description of the angels in verse 12, what does it remind us of? It reminds us of the mercy seat that we see described in the Holy of Holies, in the temple, in the most holy place, right? With the two cherubim, one on each end. And now the risen Christ, right? The angel seating, was sitting at the, at the head and at the foot of where Jesus laid. Now the risen Christ, he is our mercy seat in heaven. Thank you, Lord. See, Mary turned from the angels because she was seeking Jesus. She would have rather had the body of Jesus than the sight of angels. The person she saw next, literally the person she saw next was really Christ. But her eyes were clouded so that she could not recognize him. And that word in verse 15, supposing, she, had, she was supposed that he was the gardener. It explains all her sorrow. See, many times, God is right in front of us. And we suppose it to be something else. Because it doesn't look like what we think it should look like. But God was there the whole time. Many Christians today are miserable. Because they suppose something that is not true at all. We suppose the worst. Or we suppose that God is not working because it didn't happen the way we had contrived it that it should. But when Jesus, check it out, but when Jesus spoke her name, she recognized him. Maybe we need to cry out, God, call my name. See, it says he calls his own by name in John 10, 3 through 4, and they know his name voice. 
As soon as Jesus spoke her name, Mary knew it was him. I encourage you today from the scripture, be still and know that I am God. Be still, quiet your soul, quiet your mind, turn off the devices, eliminate the distractions, and be still and know that he is God. Here's what it says, I will be honored by every nation. I will be, says the Lord. I will be honored throughout the world. I will be. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. You just need to be still and you need to know that I am God. I will be honored. Twice he says it. And then verse 11 in this passage, it says, the Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. Right where you're at in your living room in your bedroom, wherever you're watching this, the Lord of Heaven's armies is there with you. He's there with you. The God of Israel is our fortress. See, in verse 17, Mary turns into a missionary. Why? Because she waited. Why? Because she was persistent. She was intentional. And she became a missionary. The disciples saw the Lord too. Secondly, verses 19 through 25. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. See, they're locked behind closed doors because they're afraid of Jewish leaders. We're not locked behind doors. Who are we afraid of? What are we what are we we have nothing to be afraid of? You don't need to be afraid of a virus either. Suddenly. But they're afraid they're encountering serious persecution of which we do not know of. But suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. And he says, peace be with you. He says, as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. See, let's remember this Sunday is the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. And what does it speak of? It speaks of life. It speaks of rest before works. It reminds us of God's grace. Christ came through the locked doors in his glorified body and brought the fearful men peace. Notice that two times Jesus speaks of peace in verses 19 and 21. The first peace is peace with God based on his sacrifice on the cross. That is why he showed them his hands and his side. The second peace is the peace of God that comes from his presence with us. Emmanuel, God with us. He commissioned the disciples, which means us. Those who believe in the only name of his son, Jesus, we become disciples. That means us. And what is our role? To take his place as the Father's ambassadors in the world. To go and to be salt and to be light. To be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the world. Samaria. When Jesus breathed upon them, it reminds us of Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. When God breathed life into Adam. He breathed life into them. They've been reborn. He breathed life into them. This action was personal. It was individual, giving them the spiritual power and the discernment that they would need to fulfill his commission. See, the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost was corporate and empowered them for service and empowered them for witnessing. And in verse 23, Jesus is giving the apostles, and by extension, us, the church, the privilege of announcing heaven's terms on how a person can receive forgiveness. See, here's the deal. If one believes in Jesus, then a Christian has the right to announce his forgiveness. You put your faith in Christ, I can announce that you're forgiven. Otherwise, I can't. Because forgiveness is only found in Jesus, right? He's the way, he's the truth, and the life. No one gets to God unless you go through Jesus. If a person rejects Jesus' sacrifice, then a Christian can announce that that person 
is not forgiven. Pretty straightforward stuff. Thirdly, Thomas saw the Lord, verses 26 through 31. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord, bro. We saw Jesus, man. And he replied, I will not believe. Don't try to mess with me. I won't believe it. Unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and put and place my hand in the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. This time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. So they're still in fear. But Jesus, suddenly standing there among them, peace be with you, he says. Then he says to Thomas, put your finger here, Thomas, and look at my hands. Put your hand into, my, into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe. Thomas, you believe because you've seen me. But blessed are those who believe without seeing me. See, that's you today. That's you today listening. Blessed are you who will believe in the only Son of God without seeing him. Someday you'll see him as he is. He will come in great glory and power. But until then, blessed are you who believe without seeing him. The disciples, they saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written. These are the ones written so that you may continue. This is, listen, believer, so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. That's the only way life comes, ladies and gentlemen, is by the power of his name, his power at work in you, his resurrection power that resurrects you from darkness and brings you into light, who takes you from being a sinner to transforming you to be a saint. See, Thomas, Thomas wasn't present at the first meeting. He missed the meeting, and he missed the visitation. So you might be listening today, and you might be completely checked out. If you're not careful, you'll miss the visitation. You'll miss Jesus knocking on the door of your heart. You'll miss him coming right by. How many things... How many things do we miss by being absent from the church assembly? How many things do we miss? How many words of encouragement do we miss by not coming to a church gathering? It could be one song that completely turns your week around. It could be one encouraging word from another believer. It could be a prayer. It could be, it could be a scripture that's shared in the sermon. How many things do we miss? but being absent. See, Thomas missed a visitation, and so can we. But notice Thomas's statement, except I see, I will not believe. He like didn't want to get his hopes up again, right? He was, he was alive, but now he's dead. I, I, won't, I won't believe it unless I see. I will not believe it. Until then, he's dead to me. He was called Didymus, which means twin. How many twins are there today? How many people are like Thomas today? Don't doubt anymore. Believe, even though you have not seen. Blessed are you. See the next Lord's Day, when the disciples were together, Jesus appeared to them again. What an act of grace, right? What an act of mercy. And he addressed Thomas personally. Is this amazing, forgiving love or what that Jesus shows Thomas? I mean, Thomas saw the Lord, and what had happened? He forgot all about the demands. He forgot all about his demands for proof. His testimony thrills us. He just said, my Lord and my God. But the sight of his wounds that just won his heart even more. Christ states here that you and I today can have the same assurance, can have the same blessing For we are among those who believe, yet we haven't seen him. I haven't seen him. You haven't seen him, but one day we will. As you observe these three appearances of Jesus, you can see the different results. With Mary, the issue was 
her love for Jesus. She missed him so much and wanted to take care of his body. With the disciples, the issue was their hope. All their hope was gone. They were locked in a room, huddling together in fear. And with Thomas, the issue was faith. He would not believe unless he saw proof. Because Jesus is alive today, our faith is secure. And here's what scripture says. And if Christ was not raised, your faith is in vain. See, here's the thing. If Christ isn't raised from the dead, we're all idiots. But guess what else? We get everything that the world's going to get. <laughs> if we've been believing a lie, we're going to get everything else that everybody else does. But if we're believing the truth, oh my goodness, eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God has in store for those who love him. Mm, do you love him today? See, we have a living hope through his resurrection from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 says, and if our hope is in Christ, excuse me, and if our hope in Christ is only for this life, I mean, if that's all you believe in for is for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world because our, our life is far beyond this world. It's eternal. Our hope in Christ is not for this life alone. It's for the things yet to come, right? And in verses 30 and 31, John states the purpose of his gospel, that sinners might believe and have eternal life through Jesus. These three instances and many others in this book of John gave the same witness. All of them said, I believe. All of them said, I believe. Do you? The question is, will you? Hey, believer, do you truly believe? Or are you full of doubt? Trust him today. Reaffirm your belief in what he has done. And let his power flow through you. Today, if you don't know him at all, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Turn from your sin, renounce it, trick a 180, and let him move you from darkness into light. Let him move you from being an orphan to an adopted child of the Most High God. Let him move you from being a debtor to being an heir. I mean, come on, it's belief in the one and only Son of God and then giving your life for Him. Living your life for Him, serving Him, loving Him, honoring Him, striving to be like Him, letting Him work inside of you. No greater life. Let the resurrection power of the risen Lord work in you today. Amen? Let me pray for you. Jesus, I pray today. That God, this resurrection power that raised you from the dead, God would work in us, would quicken our mortal bodies. God would, would bring things in us that have been dead to life again. Lord, if we don't even know you, that Lord, you would resurrect us. You would bring us out of darkness and bring us into your marvelous light. May we experience the forgiveness that's only found in you. May we experience the joy, the peace, that passes understand that's only found in you. God, for every believer today, Lord, as we walk through seasons where we doubt, Lord, may our belief be rekindled and be strong in you, that the resurrection power would be alive and well inside of us. God, springing up within our soul, overflowing, God, that our life will be contagious to those around us. We thank you for your word today. We thank you that you are alive and you're seated at the right hand of the Father and you're making intercession for us. We praise you for that today. We give you honor and glory and we celebrate your victory, God. And we thank you that because you are victorious, so are we in this world. We declare it, we decree it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let that power work in you this week and dive into his word. And if you confess your faith in Christ, brag about it to somebody else. Tell them you did it. Go for it. 
and your life will never be the same. God bless you. Thanks for joining us on this Resurrection Sunday.